Welcome to Healthcare Musings, a podcast dedicated to the discussion of critical care and healthcare in general. Here's your host, Dr. Hesham Hasabala. Everybody, uh, Hesham Hasabala here on Healthcare Musings, and I am so delighted to have on the podcast today, Dr. Greg Johnson. He is a colleague. He is a friend. He is one of the great minds in medicine, which is why I had to have him on the podcast. He is currently the chief medical officer of Unity Point Health, and he was formerly the uh, chief medical of uh, the, the CEO before the chief medical officer, then the CEO of hospital medicine, and then he became the chief diversity officer for sound physicians. So he was the CEO of hospital medicine for sound physicians. Then uh, it was the chief diversity officer, and now he is at Uni- Unity Point Health. And I am super uh, stoked and excited to have Dr. Greg Johnson on the podcast. Good morning. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Hesham. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I know that you're very big into the health equity uh, space, and you you had a, a, a podcast when you were uh, crossing the chasm. Uh, are, are you still doing that, or it's on hold until I can get um, more settled? I've only been at Unity Point for about three months. A lot of getting uh, my bearings, but it's absolutely coming back at the beginning of 2026. So thanks for the early uh, uh, <coughs> advertising for it uh, when it comes oh, back. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, it was. It's, it's a great podcast. Really great things. Great. He has great guests. Great, better than my guests. And although. Present company excluded, of course. Um, and and I was a, I was honored to be a guest on his yes, show. Yes, you were. And it was it was just a fantastic um, fantastic show, fantastic conversation. And I look forward to this one. So, kind of where um, where do you see it now? Um, the healthcare today. Let's just kind of start there from your from your perspective, and kind of, and then we can talk about kind of health health equity. Yeah, I think healthcare globally, right, is it's just a volatile space. I, I think you know we are um, collectively faced, uh, you know, not only from hospital and health systems, but also individual physicians in terms of a space where we need to deliver care. The pandemic highlighted that more than ever, um, but now we're in a time where. Uh, costs are being um, evaluated in every way, shape, and form. Um, Physician payments are being ratcheted down. Hospital payments are being ratcheted down. There's consolidation that's occurring everywhere. And in the meantime, our population continues to grow and continue to get sicker um, through either uh, chronic conditions of care, diabetes continues to skyrocket. Um, lung conditions, you as an intensivist are seeing um, more and more patients uh, entering our uh, ICU spaces. Uh, and um, we still continue to have an older population that we have to care for. Uh, and so we're, we're just in a volatile space in terms of trying to figure out how are we going to actually develop a system of care um, that helps us to care for our patient populations and ultimately get better outcomes despite the fact that we have twice as much stuff as everybody else in the world where we're still lagging uh, in terms of clinical outcomes. Um, then, and you brought up the health equity space, it's figuring out like, well, what does health equity mean? Why are we focusing on it? And what's the, what's the point um, when, you know, we need to take care of everybody? Well, we do need to take care of everybody, but, and I've shamelessly stolen this and I wish I could remember the individual, but there is no quality without health equity. If we're not focusing on making sure that all of our um, patients have the opportunity to get similar outcomes, then we cannot say that we are um, doing what, uh, we set out to do in terms of saying first do no harm and and identify our opportunities to, to help our communities. So volatile space, lots of opportunity for us to do better. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time, but I am optimistic that it's a great time to be in medicine because it's an opportunity to really shape the future. Yeah, that sounds, that, that is interesting. It sounded to me like it's not sustainable. I mean, healthcare needs resources, right? And everything's being squeezed. Uh, and you, like, the, it seems it seems to be uh, uh, not sustainable. What are your well, thoughts? Uh, it's current state. I don't think it is. Um, we don't. So we have a system that pays for us to do stuff. As and which in many instances 
has given us the system that we have, right? So we do a lot of procedures. We do a lot of things to people mm-hmm. as opposed to really figuring out what we can do for people. And in mm-hmm. many instances, as you are acutely aware, sometimes doing less is doing the right thing, even mm-hmm. though that's not necessarily what um, we have really trained our communities and even each other as physicians to do. Um, and so really being thoughtful about the care that we're um, that we're providing, um, really being thoughtful about how we pay for all of that. And I, I'm, I don't shy away from discussing the payment models because they are fundamental to how we alter our um, overall paradigm of healthcare to allow for um, physicians to be able to sustain practices. Um, these are, you know, that that we physicians don't work for free, um, mm-hmm. nor should they be ashamed of saying that they don't work <laughs> for free. That it's they, they've uh, invested heavily in themselves in order to be able to give back to their communities and to individual patients. Um, hospitals and health systems have infrastructure that have to be paid for in order for us to care for patients. And so, fundamentally, rethinking how we come up with a payment paradigm. Um, how we address physician well-being within that <laughs> paradigm and ultimately deliver the outcomes that our patients and our communities expect um, does require, you know, some people would call it radical. I simply think it requires rethinking because we are in a different stage than we were in the 1960s um, <laughs> and we have to do things differently. Do you think, though, it's just not American? Like I'm, I'm saying, there are, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there's, uh, you know, I, 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 my, my daughter's a first year medical student, uh, and thank God, and congratulations, she, thank you. Her, that just the generation is just different, right? Um, and uh, our culture is different. We're not used to be told being told no, and it seems to me that <laughs> you have to say no. <laughs> In healthcare, or or am I or am I missing? No, I so, so I I don't so I think you're right. There's many in the you know the initial reaction is to look at it and say, oh well, you know this is rationing care and that's un-American. We're gonna get away from doing that. And, I, and I've certainly invited people to think about this differently, which is we have become because of the cost pressures because of, therefore the time pressures that come with it time is money we have gotten away from the opportunity to engage our patients in meaningful discussions so i i my father passed about two and a half years ago no, I'm sorry. and um i know he was 15 years after a heart transplant which means that he was blessed to have more than his fair share of of time um after that but i recognize that what would have happened with him had he not had me as an advocate had he not been trained as a physician would have been such a different outcome than had others done it and i think and i invite people to think about it which was Everybody should know that their life is finite, right? You're born, you're going to live. We are all going to die (laughs) at some point in time. And inviting our patients to have the conversation on how do you want to engage the healthcare system is absolutely critical. Because I know for my father, it was very clear. And and, and this is an evolving conversation, right? It is how, what do you want, right? Do you want to spend all of your time in the hospital? Some people may want that, right? My, my grandfather, <laughs> so my, my father had one thing. My grandfather was like, if they come up with a drug on Tuesday and I need it on Wednesday, give it to me, right? <laughs> okay, gr- understand that. People should have access to that. But so many other patients are like, no, I want to be around my family. I want to be at home. I want to... And engaging in those conversations to understand, well, okay, so I'm not saying no to you, I'm giving you the care, but that means we're, that does mean we're not going to be doing certain things. And engaging in our patients in that kind of dialogue suddenly makes us much more compassionate. It does allow us to 
care for our scarce resources in a way that is more meaningful and candidly i think brings more meaning to what we do um as uh, a, a, as a healthcare system and as physicians within that healthcare system and so i, I and to the point that i was making we have to be fairly compensated for having those hard conversations because you and I both know those aren't easy conversations to have no, when you're perfectly healthy. Hundred <laughs> percent, and they're nobody wants changing. to discuss their mortality when they're healthy. But I know that if we engage with um, people, and I don't think this is a Pollyanna um, perspective, but understanding that we can save money do the right thing and allocate resources for the individuals that need it and want it more just makes more sense. But instead it is turn, 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 do as much as you can do as much, you know, and then say, well, now that we've done everything and, oh, well, you know, the outcome is going to be the same. That just, it just doesn't feel right to me. I, I totally agree. In fact, I we as intensivists do it all the time. Right. Like I did it yesterday, literally yesterday. I was right. on fifth. I just finished seven days in the ICU. Literally, I had this conversation yesterday about someone who clearly is going to need long-term mechanical ventilation. Clearly. And he did not want that. Right. And so I told the family, I said, then I can't do it. We just can't do it. And I and so am I. So am I part of that solution, for lack of a better, I mean, is to, to not say no, but to provide care? Because I don't know that we ask our patients, do what, what, what are your goals of care, right? Yeah, what do you want? What, what do you want out of this? I, I uh, you'll forgive me for giving another story, but it's still one no, of the No, I, I love the stories. Go, go. the most powerful moments for, with me at the bedside. Um, and I think you'll appreciate this, right? Um, this was a gentleman that came into the hospital, it was acute renal failure, had lots of signs and systems that were uh, uh, lots of, you know, diagnostic criteria that really were leading towards a myeloma diagnosis. And, you know, it comes in and I remember he had 11 children. And uh, as a hospitalist, that used to terrify me because it was usually the family was disconnected and everybody was going to, there was going to be a fight over this. And I remember, you know, he's, he's on dialysis, you know, put in the, his, his <clears throat> catheter for dialysis for short term, finally get his diagnosis, sit down with him and the family. And I, I'm, you know, dreading to having the conversations, confirm myeloma, you know, not a lot, he's pretty far down the line, not a lot of you know he does have treatment options but he's gonna he's he's gonna die from this yeah and i uh i vividly remember all 11 of his kids in the room with his wife and him and he looks at me and he says doc if i stop all of this together uh what happens i said well you'll you'll probably die of renal failure to be quiet um you know you'll likely just go to sleep and you won't wake up and he was like uh, and he was a minister and he turned to me and he goes, well, take the catheter out. They know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. I'm done here. And I remember sitting back for a second. I was like, what just happened? His kids started packing his bags instantly. And I remember getting a very nice note saying, thank you for getting us into hospice care. Thank you for everything you did with us. We got to do, we got to do exactly what we wanted to do as a family. And I remember sitting there and it was very early in my career. And I remember thinking to myself, I owe my patients this conversation because I had pre-determined what this conversation was going to be. And it was the polar opposite and one of the most beautiful moments I ever experienced in healthcare um, because it was really the power, not only of faith, but of having the conversation in terms of that. And I was just like, I, I owe this of patients and I wish that I had space to be able to create to, to do this. And it's not just an end of life care, it's an anything. Absolutely. I think I say that as an intensivist, I win. I hate to use that word. I win when a patient conquers critical illness and we help them. That's why I became a doctor, right? It's fantastic, right? Right. Even though I don't remember, they remember me and they come back and they're, and yeah. that's so awesome, right? Yeah, um, exactly. In fact, my, my um, this week I'm going to drop a, an episode about how patients and their families can help with burnout is by sending a thank you note. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. I yeah. give a thank it, you note. That sustains me for so long. And people should do that. It, it does. It does. It does. Because at the end of the day, like it's it it is that connection. It's the reinforcements as you know that you did something um right and well and it's just reinforcing excellent behavior so yeah absolutely and then if i can help mitigate someone's suffering like that patient yesterday if i can provide care within his red lines within his values and preferences and that means that that, that they don't suffer all the way to death because before that conversation i coded somebody and he didn't make it and that's not a dignified death right but so so i, I you had both both ways of the spectrum right yeah but if, if I can help mitigate their suffering and I say minister to the family and help them, I win. I hate yeah. that. Like, <laughs> I, I, I understand where you're coming from. You yeah. know what I mean? Really. And, and so, uh, and, and I think, and I, and I talked to Rob Bessler um, earlier and I, you know, on, on the podcast and he, they're talking about it in the office and I think they need to start. It's too late when I do it. Right. Yeah. It's way too late when I do it. It is. And I'm forced to do it all the time. Yeah. yeah all the time. You, you, you are, we are as, as hospitalists of, you know, at, and, and it's the worst time to do it, right? You are <laughs> at a crisis moment and now you're forced to make a crisis decision um, when you can, you know, you can readily inform because again, I've, I've had the flip side happen when people are just like, and, and I, and I understand it of, oh my gosh, but you know, and here are the parameters of, I want you to be able to, it's still, again, vivid memory of somebody going, okay, well, they need, you know, they're going to be, how long are they going to be on the ventilator? Well, I don't know. Well, okay, well, can you give us a sense? Because we want to see progression, positive progression. And when mm -hmm. we stick, we need you to have the conversation with us. Because if we take steps back, it will alter our thinking. And it, you know, it's again, again, it's engaged dialogue, but it's creating the time, the space, and uh, candidly, the uh, and and I and I, again I don't run away from it. The incentive, the fight, like there has to be the backing to create the people to have the space because otherwise you get what you pay for. And if it's paying for doing more stuff and putting more stuff on people, it's it's problematic. Yes, hundred percent. I agree with you. My uh, my co fellow is Dr. Omar Latif. He's now the system CEO of Rush University Health System, and he was there talking about getting to the health equity space, like the the life expectancy in the in the in the gold coast of chicago i think is like 15 years longer than the west side which is not even a 5 minute drive yep. and they're working on trying to 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 remedy that problem that when you put, that's stark that's so stark when you think about it um wh what you know for, uh, me as an intensivist we open the doors to everybody, almost right. everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like everyone's, you can use our, as long as we have the capacity, you can use our resources. But you look at uh, what are concrete steps that we, as a system, clinicians, can start to eat away at the health inequity? Because I, I, I agree, I like what you said, that there's no care without equity. Like everybody has to have access to, to care, but that's sadly not the case. Well, it, it, it is sadly the case. So I, I tell people, you know, we were trained in um, medicine, which means we were trained in evidence. And I, I sat down and I was just like, it's a big problem. Where's the evidence? Well, go back and look at the Institute of Medicine. Now the National Academy of Medicine's report on equal treatment it was written 21 years ago. Um and it's a treatise, uh, and it's a well-written, well-established that not only confirms that health inequities have existed in this country for over 60 years, but more importantly, a step-by-step -step set of recommendations on what health systems and organizations can do to resolve that. Now, interestingly enough, in May of this year, the National Academy of Medicine released its uh, follow-up report called Ending Unequal Treatment. Um, and what's a little sad, not a little, it's a lot sad, is the first portion of it is like, well, we put that out 20 years ago and basically nobody did anything that we <laughs> asked in the report or very few people did. Um, and then the, the latter portion of it was really uh, an outline on what needs to happen. And again, addressing funding from a federal um, perspective to address funding. I have said, you know, I've looked at 
both reports on equal treatment and ending unequal treatment sort of like the um it's the uh, L isomer <laughs> of the same drug, <laughs> which is like, and I would go back to the generic drug, which is let's go back to the 20 year old report. And, um, and it's really saying, what can we as a health institution, and this is certainly what we're doing at Unity Point, do in terms of evaluating what concrete steps can we take? Um, there are essentially 17 specific objectives and there's sub objectives within there but there are big and small things right on the clinical side and we did this within sound and, and it's a huge opportunity to for i think most systems is redesigning multidisciplinary rounds to formally incorporate social determinants of health and not just saying that we do it but then what do you do with it right because if you take those steps in identifying the social determinants of health um, and then identify what you can do because, again, we as physicians are, and hospital and health systems aren't going to solve this, right? Job right. insecurity is not something we can all fix, but we can say, oh, transportation's an issue. We tend to have access to addressing transportation. Um, there are housing things, knowing what you have in the uh, housing insecurity, knowing what resources you have in your respective community. And we, again, at Unity Point, have done a, a lot of work in, in, identifying um, by market community resources that we can then provide prior to a patient's discharge from one of our facilities so they get plugged in and get communities. Leveraging community health workers uh, as a specific recommendation, knowing <clears throat> that you can um, take those individual steps, and I just named three recommendations that are off the top of my head, mm -hmm. But looking at those recommendations and really saying concretely, what can we do to be able to um, do this? Simply evaluating your own systems and, you know, to the point of you as, as, a, as an intensivist, but it's getting as granular as possible of saying, you know, and again, um, I, I, it, it was something done in sound. It's something we're actively doing in Unity Point of saying, where are where are our existing disparities? Because while there are national ones, how are we contributing to the problem? So more importantly, we can identify the problem, something that we as doctors do all the time, identify the problem. Yep, yep. <laughs> diagnose. And then what do we do to treat it? And again, as a system leader, as a leader within an ICU, it's, well, I do diagnose and then I do treat problems. Treating problems, addressing the problem. Okay, well, I'm being a doctor, I'm taking data, and then I'm applying my knowledge to figure out what's going to, what we're going to do differently. And so to mm -hmm. me, I tell everybody, the evidence exists, go read it. It's, it's not a page turner, but, <laughs> but, but go read it and then sit down and figure out what can you do? Because even if you're taking a single step, that is helping to mitigate health uh, health inequities and it gets into the pattern that we learned in medicine and that's reinforced through with our public health colleagues which is then how are we engaging our communities in terms of i'm not doing something to you but how do i gauge it so i do something for you i i um the i mentioned the, the community health workers but it's also the community engage in the community in terms of of research Stanford did some uh, excellent work in terms of looking at what you can do for community scientists in terms of saying, hey, we can identify what's going on, but hey, I can come in as Dr. Johnson from Unity Point and I can go out to rural Iowa and say, oh, yeah, well, I know your problem is going to be telemedicine. But if they turn around and tell me we don't have reasonable broad broadband access and people don't have access to you know, computers, I haven't created, I've, I've named a solution that is inapplic uh, inapplicable for them. Inapplicable, How are we right. going to engage these, uh, these under, uh, you know, these poor outcome underserved um, communities in terms of a way that it's meaningful for them. So that way they can help build trust with health systems as opposed to where the healthcare system in many instances has treated um, historically disenfranchised communities pretty poorly. And mm -hmm. so I, I tend to, to just go back to the evidence and say unequal treatment is a wonderful place to start. It's a place to build. And then utilizing our clinical knowledge, 
partnerships with public health um, and partnerships within the communities to be able to provide them not only visibility as to a negative outcome, but what we can do to, to ultimately fix it. Because there are tons of solutions out there. But until we are willing to engage in a different way as, as healthcare providers and healthcare systems, we're going to continue to um, see what we've seen um, historically, which are, which are um, um, really poor outcomes in, in historically disenfranchised communities. Mm. That's, that's fantastic. And I'll link I lost you, Tesham. Hold on. I was going to say, I will link both reports in the show notes. So, so, so people, uh, so people can do that. Um, should I, should we address, so when you say social determinants of health, just so that I and the audience knows, what are you talking about? Oh, I lost your, I lost your audio. Am I back? Oh yeah. Now you're back. Okay. Yeah. I had so lost you. you, social, you yeah. <laughs> when you say social determinants of health, what do you mean? So social determinants of health are um, well-researched um, areas of health that um, don't necessarily correlate with race or ethnicity, but are um, really components of healthcare. So if you, uh, components that aren't necessarily medical that are associated with healthcare outcomes. So I highlighted transportation or transportation insecurity as one area, right? Um, and for non-clinical listeners, or maybe even some of our clin the, the clinical listeners, transportation insecurity is, right, you have an elderly patient, they don't drive, they don't have family, and so you tell them, go pick up your drugs at, go, I need you to go follow up with your primary care physician after discharge, and they're like, that sounds wonderful, I have no way to get there, <laughs> right? Right, um, right? Housing insecurity, I think very straightforward. Food insecurity, which um, I think we, we tend to particularly in this country, to take for granted, but there are food deserts that exist <clears throat> in major metropolitan areas as well as rural America. And so really breaking those those areas, and there are typically, at least in, certainly in the inpatient space, there are probably 11 that are directly correlated with um, differentiated poor, meaning poor clinical outcomes for patients. Um, those are the types of things that we're discussing. And again, from the clinician's perspective, screening for those, and for those who don't know, CMS or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services came out with not only recommendations and suggestions for the screening tools, uh, <clears throat> but then actually additional payment that goes along for screening <laughs> for those. Um, so getting, you know, trying to solve the entire problem, but really saying screen for them and then utilize what resources you have to be able to support them. Don't solve all of their problems, but at least ask. So that way we know what can potentially cause a patient to either fail care in the outpatient space or um, be readmitted um, uh, to hospitals. Should we be asking about that during my ICU rounds? Or maybe at a hospital? So, I mean, like, I, so it's funny. Should I add that Nobody, to my, uh, you know, is it A, B, a, B C, D, E, F, S? So it's it's interesting. There are a number of screening tools, and it, it was very interesting that you brought it up because I, Sergio Zanotti, one of your colleagues, brought mm -hmm. this up with me when I was with Sound, and he was like, my patients are typically on ventilators. I can't ask them anything. And I was like, mm -hmm. I understand um, where that comes from. But I, I will say that on the hospital medicine side, there is tremendous opportunity to ask for these. And again, yes. when I think of redesigning multidisciplinary rounds, it's take the opportunity to screen for those. There's wonderful screening tools that are actually tech um, accessible, 10 okay. questions, highly um, reliable. Um, I, I can't remember uh, a couple sources that I'd pull off the top of my head. I want to say Northwell Health um, had a really good one. And then there's, um, and then I believe that, um, I won't overstate that. I, I want to say HRQ had come up with one, but there are, there are several that you can actually access online um, that are quick screening tools that you can put in the hands of either nurses or physicians um, to be able to, to get to, you know, the, the questions Unity Point absolutely has a screening tool that's built into Epic for our patients. I was going to say, yeah, they have, <laughs> Epic, they have those little hands that keep, that exactly. I see on the summary and I'm just like, uh, okay. Yeah, and, <laughs> What's and the so, today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so we have all of that to be able to um, to be able to do the screening, and then uh, then there is downstream work that has to be done. Again, we have a partnerships 
through some national relationships that we have to help identify community resources by market. So again, it's not incumbent upon the physician or nurse or nurse practitioner to solve these problems, but now we've done the screening and now we can say, oh, hey, we need you to plug in with such and such in your community, and we've helped to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that actually have material impact on length of stay, that have material impact on readmissions, have material impact on mortality. And if we are doing that on a consistent basis, um, I absolutely believe that, I mean, it really should be done in outpatient space, as you mentioned, but again, our, our primary care colleagues are pressed for time. So I think wherever we can do it, we should be doing it because it is getting us more robust information about our patients and better ways to be able to support them um, in beyond what we do clinically. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And in fact, I'm uh, pretty sure I'm going to be taking over quality and patient safety committee at my hospital. And perhaps we can start, in, uh, especially when it comes to re readmissions uh, for those big things. If you want to get CMS five star and you want to Im yep. re improve readmissions, maybe really trying to focus if it's not, and I'm not saying it's not being done. I, I still have to learn, but maybe we really start to implement social determinants of health in that to try to screen for that or try to fix those things so that, and then I think you'll see downstream, downstream effects. Yeah. Um, do you, are you still, do you still do clinical work or are you all, <sighs> I, it's not scalable in my current uh, role. It really wasn't scalable in my prior role, um, and and it's not it's not here. And and you know it's a it's a great question from a health. You miss it. I, I do, I do. I miss the connection with patients um, and, and it, the connection with colleagues. And they, there was an article that came out in JAMA a couple weeks ago, um, specifically about administrative harm, and it actually resonated pretty heavily with me because. You know, it's you and I uh, see this it certainly as leaders, but but, you know, the the there are arguments that happen in the physician, um, you know, uh, lounge and every place else of, oh, those administrators, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what's happening here on the ground. And, uh, you know, when I when I moved away from the bedside, my my first thought was, well, how do I rectify that? Because, God forbid, I do end up in an ivory tower um, and and to get completely disconnected from the work. And for me, it's it was in sound and it is here at Unity Point now. OK, well if I can't do this work because I've got other things to do, then how do I spend as much time in the facilities, in our clinics with our physicians? So that way, if I'm not directly connected to the work, I'm connected directly to the people who are doing the work because they're as the administrative harm paper reads, right? That disconnection, that lack of really understanding that a decision macro decision made at a system level has direct bedside implications and you know it's never going to be perfect but how do I help to make sure that those dots are connected and I can communicate with them effectively on why the decision was made and they can provide feedback in terms of um, what changes it's made positive better you know negative otherwise so that way they just know that there's open dialogue and that the work that's being done at the bedside is always respected because I think that's the real issue about administrative harm is it's a lack of respect for the how difficult the work is at the bedside. And if we can, if I personally can ensure every physician, every nurse, every nurse practitioner, any member of the care team knows, I respect their work that you're doing and everything that we're trying to do at the system level is in support of you as a team member because you are committed to improving care for our patients and so it's a it's my own soapbox moment in terms of saying all leadership has to stay connected figure out how you're going to do it because at the end of the day um, if you can't do the work get as close to, to it as you can so that way you're not making bad decisions that's great that that's great advice i think i'm 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 still able to do that because i'm a clinician leader right i right. still do as i said i just worked in the icu yesterday yeah on call last night um so I, it gives you street cred uh, for Steve Matchett, our, our CEO for yeah. critical care says, when you work in the shift, you work in that ICU you, you, as the leader, as the regional medical director, and I have, um, it gives you street cred, right? Because yeah, I've been does. there, I understand that. I think when it's harder, when you have so much uh, responsibility for a system, but I think that's so important. That's something to remind uh, all of the, uh, you know, uh, admin colleagues that are listening to this. And, and just a note, if you hear 
drums and piano in the background. That's my son practicing. So sorry about that. I don't, but, I don't uh, hear a thing. And if I did, I'm sure it'd be uh, wonderful. It's but, actually uh, good. He, he's, he learned how to do the Mario theme. I'm really proud of him. Nice. Um, so yeah, to, to maintain that connection and maintain that so that you, you really get street cred so that you're not just the suit from uh, <laughs> you're the suit from like, for me, if you're, I'm the suit from Chicago. Yeah. Uh, when I said, you know, when, I, when they come, I say, well, okay, well, I work the shift. I know what you're talking about. And, yeah, no, it's 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 by it, it is it is the ultimate. I I always say that right. Bill Belichick, you know, greatest football coach of all time, never played football, but medicine's <laughs> different. Is right? Is medicine? Totally. You have to. I, my belief, right? Um, it's certainly my bias is that you had to have somebody say that you were an excellent clinician in order for you to advance in leadership. And so, you know, I'm, I'm glad I've worked shifts. I'm glad I've worked at at the bedside with a lot of folks because, um, you know, at least I can point to people and like, well, they can tell you how I was as a doc, but, and hopefully you see that reflected in how I am as a physician executive. So, yeah. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I, I, and, and I, it's, it's great to wear, you know, one half the what the lab coat and the other half the suit. Exactly. You look quite dapper, by the way. <laughs> you always have. You always have. And I, Thanks. I, I, I joke. I dressed like this in high school because I did. I, you I, really? <laughs> did you really? <laughs> yeah, I did. Wow. Uh, that, that, that does, knowing you, that does not surprise me. One, one bit, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and that's and that's so important to then to, to stay connected. And that's what and I think, you know, Unity Point is lucky to have you because you remember because a lot of people don't know, you know, like, what do you, yeah. you know, I'm here, I'm working Sunday afternoon. And I, I said that yesterday. I'm like, I don't, I have zero sympathy. If you have to come in on Sunday, well, guess what? Yeah. I'm here on Sunday. Yeah. And if I'm here on Sunday, you're going to have to come here on Sunday. You know well, and, 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 and to that point, right. Is and, and right. If you're not going to be at the bedside, then people need to know that you're working as hard as they are because, and, and you know, and so it's nights, it's weekends, it's whatever it needs to be to, to be in support of our teams that are taking care of patients. And I'm right there with you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Dr. Greg Johnson, I so appreciate you. Appreciate your time. It's been great to connect and see you again. And uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. I'll have you back uh, and we'll have further conversations. So appreciate you so much. And thanks for, thanks for all, thanks for all you do. Thanks, Hashem. Appreciate it. Appreciate the invitation and we'll absolutely stay in touch. Take care. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you for watching. To get every episode delivered directly to your inbox, please subscribe at healthcaremusings.com.